I'm Charles Bowman and welcome to this, a very special episode of Off the Agenda. Today we're at Marlborough House St James's London, headquarters of the Commonwealth of Nations and the seat of the Commonwealth Secretariat. And I am delighted to be joined by a very special guest, Baroness Patricia Scotland of Astle, Commonwealth Secretary General, who has had an exceptional career in law and politics. She started that career as a lawyer and in 1991, at the age of 35, became the youngest woman and black woman to be appointed as Queen's Counsel. She was also the first black woman to be appointed Deputy High Court Judge, Recorder and Master of Middle Temple. She joined the House of Lords in 1997 as Baroness Scotland of Astle, going on to serve as a member of the Foreign Office, Home Office and the Lord Chamberlain's Department. She's undertaken major reforms of the criminal justice system, including the introduction of the Domestic Violence, Crime and Victims Act. In 2007, she was appointed to Attorney General, the first woman to hold the post since its creation in 1315. She founded the Eliminate Domestic Violence Global Foundation, was appointed Prime Ministerial Trade Envoy to South Africa, elected as Alderman of Bishopsgate in the City of London in 2014, and at the 2015 Heads of Government meeting was nominated for the position as Commonwealth Secretary General by her native country of Dominica. And it is now my great, great pleasure to welcome Baroness Patricia Scotland to Off the Agenda. Baroness Scotland, Patricia, can I first of all start by welcoming you to Off the Agenda and say what a delight it is to have you uh, today, being able to speak to you about your story, about your stories. And I'm going to start by taking you right back to the beginning. You were born in Dominica in 1955 the tenth of twelve children. And when you were just two years old, your mother and father and your family emigrated to Walth Walthamstow in North East London. What was it like, both for you as a young child and indeed for your family? How do you and your family adapt to British life? And what challenges did you face being part of that Windrush generation? Well, I think it was a very uh, interesting time in the United Kingdom because it was late 1950s many Caribbean people had been here during the war and had had a most amazing experience of supporting the United Kingdom, feeling part of the fight against Hitler, saving, if you like, uh, the mother country. And so they believed they would be warmly welcomed. And indeed, you'll remember that they were invited to come and rebuild the United Kingdom. And it was an extraordinary moment because for many of the generation of the Windrush, they thought they'd be welcomed and celebrated in the same way as they would have been when they, when they had been here for the post-war moments. That wasn't what we met when we came to the United Kingdom. It was a very different world. I think the, the UK had suffered a lot financially and when you came to the United Kingdom you still saw signs which said no dogs, no Irish and either no coloureds or no blacks and it was very difficult for people to get um, employment, difficult for people to buy houses because nobody wanted to sell them and it was a very dull experience. I think for many including those of my generation, it was a bit of a shock. So a challenging environment, and you went to school in Walthamstow, and following that you obtained a Bachelor of Law degree from the University of London and were called to the bar at the Middle Temple, and you were just 21 years of age at that time and began specialising in family law. I was keen to understand what made you to decide to pursue that career in law, and how do you remember those early days in the Middle Temple? Well, uh, the first thing to say is, I mean, I had never really wanted to do law at the beginning. Um, I wanted to be a modern expression ballerina. And my father thought this was a total waste of a brain. I kept on telling him I didn't have one to waste, but he disagreed with me. And so I wanted to help people. I wanted to be a, make a difference. And because at one stage I wanted to become a social worker, and in those days you had to be 25 to be a social worker. My father worked out that if I went to, to immediately to university, I was going to come out at 20. So what was I going to do for five years? 
And so he encouraged me to think, because I was only just going to be 18, I was 17 when I took my A-levels, so he thought that I'd probably have time to just work out, because he didn't think I should go to university to do English and sociology. Um, and during that time, I went to work as an outdoor clerk for a solicitor's firm. And I thought, this is what I want to do. I want to do law. I want to be the voice for the voiceless. But by that time, it was a bit late to get into university. So someone suggested that I should go to um, Mid-Essex Tech and do uh, an external London. So that's what I did. And I had no idea that it mattered where you went. I know that sounds very naive, but it did. So when I finished my degree at 20, I very much wanted to go and to represent people. And I actually decided I want to come to the bar because I didn't want to become an accountant. <laughs> and Speaking to an accountant, I know, as you know. It's yeah. a really, really <laughs> painful, Charles, because I thought that if I had, the, if I had um, to become a solicitor, I'd have to do the accounts bit. Yes. And the idea of spending all the time, I was sure I was going to get it all in a muddle. I wanted to also be the person who made the final decision. So I didn't think I'd be very good at watching someone else mess up my cases. I thought I'd like to mess them up myself. So I decided that the bar was for me. And I was told, by the way, that that was the worst decision I could possibly make. I didn't have a hope to, uh, to succeed because the pecking order, I was told, was white male, then black male, then white female. And at the bottom of the pile would be a black female. And there weren't any really doing anything so that I should give it up as a bad job, but I didn't. Gosh. Um, well, you demonstrated just how successful you were because in 1991, you became the first black woman to be appointed a Queen's Council, QC, and you later founded the number one Grey's Inn Square Barristers' Chambers. Perhaps you can describe just a little bit about the journey in the law at that particular point, from that early beginning to becoming a QC, and what difficulties, challenges, and indeed opportunities you faced at that moment? Well, I think uh, when I started at the bar, there were very few women at the bar and very few women in the law. So I think it was about 93% of the bar were white, uh, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant male, probably. And uh, the women were few and far between. But so if you had 7%, some people sort of smaller, who were women, about 0.1% were black female and I was within that 0.1%. So it was a challenge to get um, a pupillage, uh, though I had some wonderful, wonderful people. I had, had a wonderful clerk at One Garden Court who assisted me greatly and a brilliant um, a pupil master, Paul Randolph, who had had a great friend, who had uh, a great African friend, and he somehow believed that all um, black people were brilliant and s because if you must be brilliant to survive. And he was fantastic. And so gradually I got more and more cases and I had a tendency to win them by some stretch of peculiarity. And then I won and I won and I won. And I won, I think, because I loved the work I did. I loved the fact that we were able to make a difference. I loved fighting for justice. I liked the fact that we were able to be a di make a difference, to be a difference. And I was one of the founding members of One Grays in Square in 1979. Keith Evans was then the head of Chambers. And we were seen as radical in as much as we were the first set of chambers to invest in a fax machine. <laughs> I remember there was this whole, whole uh, a meeting in chambers about if we should buy a fax machine, to whom would we fax? Because there was no one else who had one. And of course, that just shows you how long ago that was. Extraordinary. Um, and I, of course, it was a remarkably successful Chambers. But, but beyond that, in, in fact, in October 1997, after many years of being a hugely successful uh, barrister, you received a life peerage and were created Baroness Scotland of Astle in the county of Oxfordshire. 
and at that moment in time became a working Labour peer. And in the, your early years, you carried out an extraordinary array of different activities. And I, again, perhaps you could explain a little bit about how you felt at that moment and tell our listeners about some of that work you performed as a working peer in the early days in politics. Well, when I first came in, I firstly had no aspiration to become a minister, but I did want to work on the backbenches. I did want to make a contribution, uh, particularly to look at foreign affairs, um, at the Caribbean, and I was made chair of the advisory group on the Caribbean. And then, much to my surprise, I was invited to become the Parliamentary Undersecretary of State in the Foreign Office. And I actually got to do lots of the things that I'd spent the whole of my life aspiring to do in terms of policy. So, for example, I was able to, to create a uh, uh, pro bono mm -hmm. panel uh, to do international child abduction, to address that, to look at what we were able to do in terms of responding to forced marriage. But I was given the wonderful opportunity of reforming the consular division. At that time, we'd had a number of incidents across the um, portfolio, and they haven't gone well. There'd been terrible, terrible crises. Some of our citizens had been left in different places, and there was a, a de degree of dissonance about how we as a country had responded. So what I did is I did a review of all the disasters that had occurred before 1999, when I became a minister, and looked at what we'd done, but also what we'd failed to do. And I asked those who were involved in them, how could we have done better, what the good things were, what the bad things were, and as a result, we radically changed consular division's approach to responding to disasters. I was incredibly proud of it because we created a multidisciplinary response, a one-stop shop, so that if a disaster did happen, then we would be able to respond in a way that would make a real difference. And I was so proud that shortly after I left the Foreign Office and became a Minister of State in the uh, Home Office, we were able to respond with great alacrity and success to the 9-11 disaster. And it was a matter of huge pride to me that during that time, all of the people who needed help received the sort of help that they most required. And I believe there was not one complaint made in relation to that disaster. And I was hugely proud that a number of the officials who'd worked with me so trenchantly and so devotedly received great awards. And that was a matter of huge pride that we had created a system that really had made a difference to those who were suffering and in need of support. That's interesting because I was going to raise 9-11 and all that hard work that you had undertaken, reviewing all the disasters before and shortly thereafter, of course, 9-11 happened. And as you say, a great sense of pride that that hard work, diligence, approach, reform yeah. actually paid its dividend at the yeah, time. Yeah, we were ready. And the thing that we'd been thinking of is that I, I really didn't want anyone to go through such a terrible, heartbreaking experience again and feel that we had let them down or we hadn't done everything that we could. So I wanted all those people who'd shared with me the pain and suffering of the earlier incidents to feel that their experience had actually helped us to make sure that others did not have to suffer in the same way. And I was delighted because when we first started, there were a lot of complaints, to be frank, mm. about the fact that we weren't human in our response. And so we changed what we did. Instead of saying what we couldn't do, we said, let's see what we can do. You, know, you can write to a department and they'll say, I'm sorry, it's not my, you know, I can't help you. Yes. And so I introduced the idea that we should say, look, I'm sorry that you are suffering in this way or that your aunt died or you didn't, weren't able to do A, B, C and D. And we can't do everything for you, but this is what we can do. 
And we looked at what the whole government could do and we made ourselves into a one-stop shop. And it was marvellous to see the, the letters we got back, people saying, I accept you can't do everything, but thank you so much for understanding, thank you for walking with us, thank you for doing what you can. And it made our officials feel so much, much better. better. So instead of feeling that they were, 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 were making things worse, they could actually think that what we're doing is we're helping and we're making a difference. And it made them more innovative and them work harder. And it was a virtuous circle. So I think it was a, an example of what you can do if you listen to others, you really care about them, and you act on what you're told. Indeed, Government at its best. It's a wonderful story. Moving slightly on uh, to June 2007, and you were appointed at that moment in time at the, as the Attorney General, Prime Minister Gordon Brown, and you were the first woman to hold that office since its creation all those years back in 1315, a very, very significant step for women in, in UK politics. How did you feel uh, about this achievement at that time? And perhaps also to explain a little bit to our listeners about the nature of the role of the Attorney General. Well, the Attorney General's role is um, quite a painful and difficult one. I think Francis Bacon said it was the most painfulest place in the realm and nothing has changed. Because as Attorney General, you are advisor to Her Majesty the Queen, you are advisor to the government, to Parliament, you are also the guardian of the public interest and the rule of law, and you are the chairman of, the, well, you are the head of the bar, and you are also the chief prosecutor, if you like, and you, you are the supervisor, superintender of all the prosecutorial authorities. And you hold all those hats in common, but you are in government, but not of government. So you end up having to tell the government what they need to know, but not always what they want to hear. And it's, it's a very a burdensome role, but it's a role that should be discharged with real independence and integrity because you have to juggle those different hats. And one of the things that's really important is that the Attorney General has to understand that the Attorney General is the guardian of the rule of law. And I was going to say, uh, one of the great assets that the country has that we need to cherish, nurture, invest in at, at every level possible is exactly that, of uh, our rule of law uh, and the independence of our rule of law. But I, but I think it's really important because traditionally the Attorney General has always been a senior member of the profession, has always been a silk in their own right, right yeah. not an honorary silk, and who had the experience and opportunity to give that independent advice, independent from those who may advise them within the system. I, I know that there are a number of attorneys who I've spoken to who were put in a position where others may advise you to go one way and it is your role reading all of the information to then decide independently what the law should be. And I saw that very clearly. I mean, one of the first cases I had is whether we should or should not um, appeal a decision. One of the other residual roles the attorney has on behalf of the uh, people of this country is to appeal against decisions which they think are unfair or not in the public interest. And you have to do that from a step from a position of experience and understanding. And I think also the attorney should be able to have sufficient experience and um, skill if the need arises to go to court and argue the case themselves. And if attorney doesn't have that ability and doesn't have that skill, then that is a shame because that is a skill that our nation needs. Um. Thank you. That's a, a very clear articulation. I'm sure 
um, our, all our listeners will be will really value that that explanation. But as well as national politics, you've also played an important role in local government. Uh, indeed, you and I both have shared time together as elected members of the City of London as aldermen. You were the alderman of the ward of Bishopsgate uh, from 2014 until this year. Uh, and there is, I know, some neat symmetry to that story is at the age of 16, when awaiting your O-level results at the time, you worked all those years ago back in uh, Bishopsgate. But can you give me uh, your views as to the importance of local government in the context and the framework of of uh, national society and, and more, and the role that the City of London has played and indeed can continue to play uh, for the country going forward? Well, the city is extraordinarily important. If you look at our history, it was there right at the very beginning. Even if you look back at Magna Carta, the City of London is noted. And so the city has had a powerful um, role to play in how our financial sector works. It's been the beating heart of the global uh, economy, not just the economy of the United Kingdom. It is multicultural, multilingual, and it represents, I think, some of the best that is available in the world. And it was curious that in all those years, uh, more than a thousand years, uh, I think I was the first black person to be uh, elected as a, an alderman of the City of London, but I was only the fourth woman. And so it was a real opportunity for us to look at how London, the city, could be well governed, better governed, and we needed a diversity of view and diversity of opinion. And I think that the city has changed and is changing, and it's an evolution, it's an iterative process, and will change more. But if you look at what it now must do in order to maintain its primary position as the uh, jurisdiction of choice, then we know that there is much in terms of our values, in terms of our principles, in terms of the law that we must maintain. And particularly now in this new digitalized world, having statutory and legal uh, structures which are capable of maintaining those global standards, I think are really important. And the fact that we have more diversity and are becoming more and more diverse, I think is really important. But the skill sets that London has always been responsible for producing for the globe, I think need to be and are being preserved. But there is much, much more to do. Indeed, and we thank you for your enormous contribution, uh, Patricia, throughout your years as uh, an alderman. And one of the agendas that you and I have shared is around values and trust, um, which, as you say, is absolutely critical, underpins uh, the agenda going forward. 2015, in what was a true breakthrough for gender equality in the Commonwealth, you were selected as the Secretary General and, again, the first woman to hold the post, taking office the following year. And amongst many other agendas, you pledged to prioritise gender equality, combat domestic violence and highlight the climate crisis effects on smaller Caribbean uh, islands. The Commonwealth, as you so often say, is an extraordinary association of now 56 countries, comprising 2.5 billion people. What have been, to you, the sort of challenges and opportunities in your role and in the current climate of geopolitics? And, and what role do you foresee the Commonwealth playing as we move forward? Well, I think as you rightly say, Charles, the uh, Commonwealth is a most extraordinary collection of countries because we're not bound by treaty. This is a voluntary association of nations bound by values, which makes it extraordinary and exceptional. And if you look at the things that the Commonwealth has done from its inception, it has always spoken to the best of us. And um, it's important to remember that in 1953, when Her Majesty the Queen was describing this Commonwealth, which is the new Commonwealth, she said it was the most extraordinary 
uh, expression of what was best in humanity, but she also talked about partnerships between people and races. Now, in 1953, nobody was talking about equality between the races, but the Commonwealth was and always had, and you'll know that the Commonwealth was instrumental in breaking apartheid. And I think it was Nelson Mandela who said that the Commonwealth made it safer for diversity and safer for humanity. And if you look at the other elements that have threatened our world, not just uh, bad governance and inequality, but climate change, once again, it was the Commonwealth who was at the forefront. In 1989, that's before the first COP, before the first IPCC report, it was the Commonwealth in Langkawi, in Malaysia, who said that climate change posed an existential threat to us. And everything, unfortunately, that was laid out in that um, climate declaration has regrettably come true. But if you then look at the Commonwealth, we never gave up. We kept on pushing year after year. And if you then look at what happened in 2015, in Malta, it was at the Commonwealth that it was absolutely committed by all the leaders that we needed enforceability of a new compact. We needed two degrees and we needed a 1.5 aspirational target. What happened a month later in Paris? Two degrees, 1.5 aspirational target, enforceability. And the Commonwealth has just kept on pushing it. In um, Kigali this year, the Commonwealth came together again and said, we need to address loss and damage. We've been trying to get loss and damage on the agenda for 27 years. And at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, the Commonwealth 56 basically said, loss and damage has to go on the agenda. What happened in November as a result of that push, loss and damage is now on the agenda. So climate change, regrettably, is a real existential threat to all of us. And we've seen it devastate the five regions of our world. So many, just look at what's happened to Pakistan, one third of the country underwater, an area bigger than the United Kingdom, 33 million people displaced, 1,700 died, 13,000 injured, billions and billions of loss uh, occurring. And what's happening in Africa with drought, desertification, flooding, um, people dying. We now have the prospect as a result of all the exogenous shocks that have happened, not least the conflict in Ukraine and Russia, uh, real food insecurity. The World Food Programme talks about a ring of fire around um, the world. Many of the countries within our Commonwealth are part and within that ring of fire, and we see poverty and desertification rising, but we also see hunger, which we haven't seen for a very long time. So the world is in a pretty perilous state, but the Commonwealth, if you look at what we're doing, we're fighting, and we're fighting together. We're not fighting against each other, we're fighting with each other in order to overcome the difficulties and to deliver on the SDGs. And those sustainable development goals are in fact the sustainable development goals which were agreed by the Commonwealth in 2013. If you look at our charter, yeah. 1 to 16, it's 1 to 16 of the sustainable de development goals. SDG 17, which is partnership, is right there in the core of everything we do. And we are determined to make the difference. If you look at trade, we have over $700 billion of trade, intra-commonwealth trade between our commonwealth during this terrible time over COVID. That not only remained, but it started to grow. So we've now got $768 million, billion dollars, I beg your pardon, billion dollars of trade with the commonwealth. We hope to get one trillion by 2024, two trillion by 2030. But that's because that 
intra-Commonwealth trade, we have a 21% advantage because we share the same Real laws, rules. the same values, the same institutions. And that similarity, that co those core values make it faster, easier, cheaper for us to trade one with each other. So our values actually generate wealth. And that is something which will enable us to go forward onto the digital world. Because right now, when we looked at why did our trade stand up? Why didn't we have a dip like anyone else? It's because digital trade increased during that time to compensate for the others. And we really are hoping that we can drive the current 21% advantage up to, what if we could do 30? What if it was 30% cheaper, faster, easier for us to trade with each other than anyone else? And we've got opportunities now with the African continental free trade area, with the World Trade Facilitation Agreement. All of these could give us the potential of raising our intra commonwealth trade to above two trillion by 2030. That's so there's lots for us to do. And of course, trade that creates for social cohesion, social exactly. cohesion, stability, stability, yeah. security. And gosh, that is yeah. a commodity that the world needs at this immediate yeah. moment in time. So and that's a wonderful story. And it's very important for us to remember that 60% of our Commonwealth is under the age of 30. 30. So uh, it's growing. Yeah. It's growing. And next year will be the 50th year of the Commonwealth Youth uh, Programme. And it's the year of the youth next year, as well as the peace, year of peace. And we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Commonwealth Charter. So the future is bright and lots of different countries are now lining up wanting to join us. I think we have 36 republics, the, the two newest being Gabon exactly. and Togo. Yeah. And there are others knocking on the door saying they'd like to come into our family. And when I ask them, why are you attracted? They say, if you could join a club with a 21% advantage, with a 700 billion plus intra-government trade, which represents one third of the world, who has a petri dish of every simple um, type of country, um, small ones, big ones, landlocked ones, island states, who were all joined by the same value systems. Mm -hmm. Who wouldn't want well, to join such a family? Indeed. And so the queue is, getting longer. <laughs> well, that's a very, very exciting, uh, very exciting to hear. But you mentioned the Queen a little earlier. In, in your capacity as Secretary General, you were heavily involved in the historic events of, of recent months following the death of Her Majesty, our late Queen Elizabeth II. This included, amongst many others, uh, being part of the Accession Council and also giving the first reading at the state funeral in Westminster Abbey. And I was particularly keen to understand what were your feelings as you stood up to read that lesson. And perhaps also, what are your reflections on the extraordinary life and reign of our late monarch, Queen Elizabeth II? Well, I think it was quite an extraordinary privilege to be asked to read, and it was an even greater privilege to understand that Her Majesty the Queen had wanted me to read. And I think it spoke a lot about her and her love of our Commonwealth. I think a number of people don't realise that it was the first time that a monarch had had the funeral, not in St Paul's Cathedral, but in the Abbey. And to understand why Her Majesty the Queen chose to have the funeral in the Abbey, I'm sure that it would have been the most extraordinary funeral wherever it had taken place, and certainly if it had been in St. in St Paul's, one would have seen the whole pageantry of the Church of England at its very best. I'm sure every archbishop, every bishop would have been there, but it would have been a quintessential Church of England affair. What Her Majesty did, which I thought was breathtaking, is she turned her funeral into a moment for unity between people, between races, between religions. I think it was very moving to see on the um, 
the, the central part on the altar, every denomination of Christian. Yep. You saw the Catholics, the Church of England, the Baptists, the Methodists, um, the Presbyterians, the, all of them were represented. But at the foot of the altar, all other religions were there too. And the Her Majesty's funeral was an extraordinary um, demonstration of everything she loved in her life, everyone who was important. And it was the most moving thing for me, and actually one of the most difficult things I have ever done is to stand before her with the coffin in front of me and then have to read the words that she wanted read. And she was a woman of great faith. And my reading was all about the faith in Jesus Christ, that he had overcome everything and that he would overcome everything and that mortality um, the, 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 the most important thing to overcome was death itself and that you didn't have to be afraid of death. Uh, and I um, was very honored that as a Catholic, uh, that she had chosen me to read that, but also very touched that she'd asked the Cardinal of the Catholic Church to read the prayer for the uh, Commonwealth. And when I did that reading, I really wanted, I was really thinking of her and I wanted people not to hear my voice, but to hear the message that God was giving. So um, I hoped in my humble way that I was able to do what she would have wanted me to do. And that's express the love that she had for not only humanity, but the love and firm belief she had in her saviour, Christ the King. Gosh, thank you, Patricia, for that, that, that answer. And it brings me really on to my final question. You, Patricia, have been and still are an exceptional role model. Uh, that final question is one that I ask to every guest on Off the Agenda, and that is that we live in difficult, challenging times uh, where perhaps hope and aspiration are much needed. What lines of advice and support and encouragement would you give to that younger generation, the next generation, as they start their own career path today? I would tell them to believe in themselves. Everyone will tell you that that which you aspire to do is impossible, but it's not impossible. And that there is no disgrace in failing. The only disgrace is in not having tried. You never know what you can achieve if you try. If you look at what happened to me, I was always told that everything that I aspired to do was impossible. It couldn't be done. And I really didn't like being the first. But I remember my father telling me, well, someone has to be first, so why not you? So I'd say to them this, someone has to be first, so not, why not you? Um, I'd also say to them that they need to be clear about what they want to do. I found that there are two types of people, those who want to be someone and those who want to do something. And I would say concentrate on doing something. Every single one of you has a skill. You need to find that skill, hone it, and then use it for the benefit of others. And if you do that, you'll have an extraordinary life. What a wonderful way to finish. That is a lovely way to finish. And I, that belief in self, clarity, and there's no disgrace in failure. Yeah. Um, and I would I, say belief in God, because I have to tell you that um, everything I have achieved in my whole life has been by His grace. So I say, believe in God. Faith. Patricia, Baroness Scotland, it has been an absolute delight. Thank you so much for sharing your story and your inspirational stories all the way through. We wish you all the very best with what is a clearly an extraordinarily exciting agenda for an extraordinary institution, the Commonwealth, and we look forward to hearing more about that in due course. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Well, it's been a real honour and privilege to speak to Baroness Patricia Scotland today and to hear her inspiring story and stories. Thank you, Patricia, and thank you all for listening. That's all for me, other than to say, as always, stay tuned for more conversations, great discussions, and inspirational guests. Thank you again, and bye for now.